You're watching Northern Crimes. September 16, 1991. It's a brisk fall afternoon at Thunderbird Falls, a quiet wooded neighborhood nestled in the woods of Eklutna, 30 miles north of Anchorage. 44-year-old David Kerr, a shift supervisor at a nearby power plant, is arriving home after work. With him, a package he's just picked up from the local post office. The box, addressed to his 19-year-old son George, seems odd, but Kerr doesn't think much of it. Instead, he sets the package down on the kitchen counter. After visiting with his wife Michelle, Kerr returns to the kitchen, drinks a glass of water, then again looks at the mysterious package. He decides to open it. First, he methodically removes the paper wrapping. Next, he grabs a utility knife from a drawer and begins to cut into the box. In the blink of an eye, the package explodes. As the dust settles, Kerr's neighbors, who describe the blast as, quote, thunderous, rush out of their homes and are shocked by what they see. The explosion has opened a hole in the center of the roof, knocking down multiple walls and blowing out windows. A film of fine gray insulation dust falls to the ground like light winter snow. When police arrive, they find David Kerr dead, blown apart by the explosion. But miraculously, Michelle is alive and rushed to the hospital. A nurse would later tell reporters that, quote, she looked like she was in Vietnam. In the coming months, the story would go on to involve Anchorage police, the FBI, and a special team of investigators from the U.S. Postal Service. What they would unravel was a chain of events that was almost too strange to believe, a tale of revenge, betrayal, and murder. This is Northern Crimes. To understand why a mail bomb exploded in September 1991, killing David Kerr and seriously injuring his wife Michelle, we need to go back almost a year to the fateful night of October 19, 1990. It was a crisp Friday night when Rob Chamberlain and his friend Jeffrey Kane were driving southbound along the Glen Highway, just north of Anchorage. As they approached the exit ramp to Muldoon Road, a loud crack suddenly pierced the air. Rob turned to see a hole in his rear window, but the true horror lay in the sight of his friend, Jeffrey, slumped in the passenger seat, covered in blood. In shock and full of adrenaline, Chamberlain sped onto the off-ramp and pulled into the nearest parking lot that he could find, a bustling Kentucky Fried Chicken. Within minutes, authorities arrived at the scene where 20-year-old Jeffrey Kane was pronounced dead. Initially, authorities had no motive or suspect. Kane was a 20-year-old computer programmer with no known enemies. Nonetheless, search dogs scoured the highway near the shooting site, looking for any kind of evidence. Within hours, they had located fragments of a high-caliber bullet now authorities were left to wonder, was this an intentional attack or a random act? Fortunately, it wouldn't take long to find out. On Saturday, October 20, a young man named George Kerr walked into the Anchorage Police Department with his lawyer and began to tell a story. He told police that the night before, he was driving into Anchorage with his two friends, Doug Gustafson and Raymond Cheely, after an afternoon of target shooting. He stated that Gustafson and Chile began talking about shooting at a Toyota sports car that they thought had passed too closely as they drove towards town. 
Kerr stated that he tried to talk them out of it, but to no avail. Gustafson, riding in the passenger seat of his own car and with an assault rifle in hand, fired at the Toyota as it left the highway at the Muldoon exit. Later, Kerr, who was upset by the shooting, got out of the car and took a cab back to his home in Eklutna. It wasn't until he saw the paper the next morning that he realized someone had been killed. Later that day, police received a warrant to have Kerr wear a wire, which he agreed to in hopes that he could get Cheely and Gustafson to admit their guilt. And later that evening, Kerr was able to record the pair admitting to the shooting. Within days, Doug Gustafson and Raymond Cheely were arrested and charged with Jeffrey Kane's murder. George Kerr accepted a plea deal in exchange for immunity in testifying against his two friends. And because authorities were not able to locate the murder weapon, Kerr would be the key to their case. In the summer of 1991, Doug Gustafson and Raymond Cheely were convicted of the murder of Jeffrey Kane. Both were sentenced to life in prison. Shortly thereafter, George Kerr left Alaska, eventually ending up in the Navy. Presumably, he was hoping for a fresh start, distancing himself from his troubled past. But unfortunately, the past would soon catch up with him. While authorities taped off the crime scene and began investigating the bomb that killed David Kerr, paramedics rushed his wife Michelle to the hospital. Her injuries were catastrophic. Every bone in her face was broken, both eardrums were burst, and shrapnel riddled her body. No one thought she would survive. So investigators tried to get any information from her that they could, and what she told them was shocking. Yeah, there's some police officers here. Just repeat what you think happened. Go ahead. Well, we got a package for George from the state of Alaska. I know it's from Doug. How do you know that it was from Doug, Michelle? Because George put him in jail. George As Michelle was wheeled into surgery, investigators went to work. During David Kerr's autopsy, investigators pulled a piece of metal from his chest. They were able to identify it as part of a switch. Further, they identified the manufacturer and were able to trace it to a local radio shack. Based on Michelle Kerr's statement, authorities were already highly suspicious of Gustafson and Chile, but they were in prison. How could they have been responsible for building and mailing a bomb? Fortunately for investigators, all the phone calls were monitored at the facility the two suspects were being held. So they started listening in. Within a matter of days, they discovered a call that had taken place shortly before the bomb went off a call between Doug Gustafson and his sister, Peggy. The two appeared to be speaking in some sort of code, and this piqued investigators' interest. Yeah, now this is to fix your car, remember? As soon as you find out which way is on, which way is off on the sliding one, uh -huh. glued in place, like I described, right below the surface, uh -huh. so that when it's pushed towards the side, it's on. Which pushed towards the center, it's off. Right. Okay. Although the conversation was vaguely disguised as instructions to fix an issue with a vehicle, authorities saw it for what it was, Gustafson giving his sister instructions on how to build a circuit for an explosive device. But there was more. In reviewing other conversations, authorities learned that Peggy was struggling to construct the bomb on her own. So, she enlisted the help of her older brother, Craig, who was a mechanic. Additionally, both Peggy and Craig believed their brother was innocent and that George Kerr had fired the gun, killing Jeffrey Kane. To give an idea of the level of revenge and emotion she must have felt at the time, Peggy Gustafson was nine months pregnant 
a mere three days away from giving birth the day she delivered the bomb to the post office. Meanwhile, authorities interviewed cellmates and prisoners of Gustafsson and Chile and learned Chile had a hit list. At the top of the list, George Kerr. And when investigators brought Peggy and Cragen for questioning, they played the recorded tapes. The two immediately confessed. As the dust settled from a random shooting and a devastating mail bomb, the lives of many people were changed forever. Michelle Kerr, who now lived with permanent injuries from the bomb, sued the state of Alaska and was awarded damages exceeding $11 million. Peggy and Craig Gustafson were convicted for their role in the bombing and each sentenced to a minimum of 22 years. As for Raymond Sheely and Doug Gustafson, they both received additional life sentences and will never be eligible for parole. The Alaska mail bomb murders revealed the hidden darkness beneath Alaska's serene surface. Although justice prevailed, one question remains. What other secrets lie buried in Alaska's icy grip? Only time will tell.